I really believe I that. Yep. So uh, how could we continue what we're saying, how the war on drugs is actually a war on higher education? Well, um, do you, kn you know about the HEA, right? The Higher Education Act. Ha do you know anything about it? I'm it's sure you do. It's a horrendous law it's, is what it's it is. It's the most disgusting law. That I, one, one of the more disgusting laws that's ever been passed. Um, what it does is it prevents any applicant for federal aid who has a drug conviction from getting federal aid. So what kind it of message is this that. sending? It's sending the, the message that we don't want to help you if you've done drugs before. We just want to punish you by not letting you go to school. Right. Mm -hmm. But also understand that that particular act, that particular law, doesn't affect the rich people so much because they don't have to worry about getting loans. It affects the middle and the lower class uh, of people that need these loans to go forward and unfortunately those are the ones that are caught in this net of the Higher Education Act. Now if my memory serves me right there's a John Perry Foundation. You familiar with that? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, John Perry Foundation takes donations and you know puts forth the money to people who are in need. Right, to help those students that have had a conviction and they're looking for uh, monies to continue the college education. But, but personally uh, in my campaign, I campaign for free college and uh, free tuition and fees at community colleges and uh, state universities. I don't think our students should be strapped with all of this, these um, bills that could be high in some cases as uh, two, uh, two and a half, uh, two hundred thousand uh, dollars for going to school. So I, I believe that, I don't believe, I know, we've got to have free higher education. Right, well if we weren't spending, what, how many <laughs> well, billion dollars a up year? Up until to this afternoon, yeah. about oh, 6 p.m. at the federal level was over 18 million dollars, or excuse me, 18 million, 18 billion. billion. The state level was 28 billion dollars. No, no, you're talking about in the Money past year, this year mm -hmm. on the war on drugs, nationally, right? Yes. Right, nationally. nationally. I mean, thank God Connecticut hasn't shelled out twenty-eight billion dollars on this war this year, but it sure feels like it sometimes. Wow. To bring a total so far to date, now this is November. This show will be broadcast around the turn of the year. Uh, Forty-six billion dollars so far. Now that's only what the drug war clock uh, from the war uh, drugwar.org. Uh, has what's available. I know, like Peter Chris has said, it's far exceeds that amount. It's probably Peter closer Chris. to $100 billion a year. One of the founders from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, fine, outstanding organization, which we always want to plug here on the program. Something else I really found rather interesting was about the hypocrisies of our government here, you know, like the Higher Education Act. You know, if, if you have a drug conviction, you can't get federal money, but you could have a murder conviction, a uh, robbery conviction, you could still Thank qualify. You for stating the truth. You know, and then, like, also I found. Um, on the normal web page was Connecticut State marijuana stamp tax mm -hmm. and about 25 other states actually have this tax based on a gram per gram basis now it, it uh, to me it's just another way it seems like another way to stick it to the people because right. if you're arrested for over 42 grams of marijuana they can also tax you 200 percent plus throw uh, 10 years in jail and six thousand dollar fine on top of all that now, if you could go and buy one of those permits, then I suppose now you have legal permission to use it. Uh, you can't buy one. No, because if you look at the questionnaire from this, and this is legit, folks, because here's another from the government's webpage, Connecticut Marijuana and uh, Controlled Substance Tax, and this is informing the uh, drug enforcement and other agencies, law enforcement, on how to handle this tax. And if you look at the uh, application of this form, first thing it has on the bottom, and this is just a sample form here, is talking about the guy's uh, 1999 BMW they want to forfeit, or they want to seize his property forfeitures in his house and a few other things. And so, you know, this, this war on drugs is not designed to be won. It's just another example of the, right. of the hypocrisies that we deal with. So, and that was all found at the uh, normal National Organization for Marijuana webpage. So, you know, go check it out for yourself. The uh, documents I got from the state of Connecticut webpage, official documents. So, you know, we're not making these things up. No. Well, I was really glad that you guys had got together prior to getting together on the show. And being the last show in the series, I'm really psyched that you're both here. Because now you got to talk about how we can make the change together here. You know? Well, 
that's a long, arduous process. <laughs> it's going to take a concerted effort by all the people concerned in and around reforming the drug laws to get together and work. The thing that I say over and over again is going to change this is legislation. But first of all, you've got to give the people behind you. What I found on the campaign trail was that most people think the way we do. However, what we have to do is create or help them or give them uh, or work with them to get courage. Because the biggest problem with uh, changing the laws is that the people are afraid to come forth. Now, if in fact everyone that smoked cannabis would come forth and be supportive, we wouldn't be having this conversation. 30 million strong at least. Right. But they won't come forth for fear of some type of ostracization, which is true. Some people may be fired from their job if they come out and, and say they're um, a responsible uh, cannabis user, or a lot of other things that they may say in and around the illegal drug market. So it's important that we help pave the way because we have the courage. We're out there talking about the issue in the manner it should be talked about, but most people are afraid to do that. Right, right. Well, where else could we take this program here? What kind of response has Wesleyan students been getting? I mean, you know, I, when you talk to like high school kids or college kids, you know, the uh, marijuana, pro-marijuana and all that, but I mean, you know, what kind of response are, are they really, you know, getting involved? Are they looking at it in a, uh, as a political fight and not just so much, say, as a, a protest against the system? I, I really think that um, a lot of students at Wesleyan aren't aware of the facts of the drug war because like Cliff was saying earlier, it really does not affect us as much. We're privileged white kids, most of us, and like, I, most of us. And I'm going to say like, there are exceptions because Wesleyan does have a, a blind admissions policy when it comes to need. So right. there are kids there who like, who, who do work, you know, and like, uh, who probably would get shit on the outside for it. But at Wesleyan, there are a lot of people who aren't aware. And so what we're trying, we're at the basic stage right now of just like trying to raise awareness within the community. The response hasn't as been as big as we expected because Wesleyan is um, a pretty open community with cannabis use. And um, we expected a lot of people to come out for this, but I guess they just don't see it as a problem. And so there's no one responding to this lack of a problem because it is not a problem at Wesleyan. Right. It takes time to build. You're starting anew. There was a, an SSDP chapter at Wesleyan a few years ago which was very active. Right. And prior to that there was a huge normal chapter. The thing that you have to ensure is that when you start this organization that you're training the all of the young people behind you to take over when you leave. That way you keep it into a fluid transition and the issue is at the forefront all of the time. I've seen many chapters, huge chapters die because they did not train people to come behind them. So that's most important that you train people to take over when you leave. And you know, I will guide and, and, and point you in the right direction for a lot of things to help the chapter grow. Thank you. Thank You're, you so much oh, for that. Oh, this is my job. I'm dedicated to this stuff. <laughs> so now, what can uh, other people do who say they, you know, they, they catch this program and they want to get involved, and not just necessarily say monetarily wise, not that money doesn't help, right. you know, but what, what can other people do? Well, first of all, you can contact my organization and you can reach me at uh, the three W's, uh, efficacy-online.org. And from that, you can send me an email or give me, give, give me a call or whoever answers the phone and we could start working you to get, get involved in this, in, in this movement. Because there are other organizations, a better way, LEAP has a, a growing faction in Connecticut, you can volunteer for and work for them because there's tons of stuff you, you can do. We, we, this movement is very, very diverse. You have some people just deal with medical marijuana, some people just deal with uh, cannabis. Uh, then you have people that look at uh, harm reduction methods such as safe injection rooms and needle exchange. It's 
total throughout the country there there's there is over two hundred thousand people working on this issue 